pleasure for me to be before you once again. Certainly thankful for your presence this morning. If you would, be turning over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I would like for us to study a portion of that chapter this morning. Now we find in this chapter that the Apostle Paul is warning his audience against false security. False security. And in order to do that, he points back to the children of Israel for his example. As the chapter begins, verses 1 through 5, we see that he wrote, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now this chapter was written so that the, the Corinthians would not be ignorant. Paul wants them to know something that is important for their salvation, and by extension, ours today. Paul refers to the Jews and a portion of their history. And then he outlines some of their privileges, as we just read. The cloud was meant and used for protection from both the enemy and from the heat of the sun. Psalm 105, verse 39. We see that the Red Sea was used as a safe passage for Israel, yet also a grave for the pursuing Egyptians. This developing nation was given manna and quail later on from heaven as a means of sustenance. And we see that they too were supplied with a water source. In spite of these blessings from Jehovah God, Israel would go on to rebel against him. This wicked attitude and behavior brought about their eventual destruction. Paul then proceeds to recite each of their faults and even their punishments. The nation of Israel was the church of the Old Testament. Thus they serve us today as our example. May we then give heed to the warnings listed, lest we suffer just as those people did of that day. So I'd like to discuss verse by verse, some warnings that Paul gives to the Corinthians. Warning number one, we find that they lusted after evil things. Verse six of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. It says, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You see, Israel as a nation, as a group of individuals, began to crave or set their hearts upon evil things. We find throughout their, the wilderness wandering that God supplied for their physical needs. He sustained them. He provided their food, their manna, and he provided their water. Yet this proved to be insufficient for this people. Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them, that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and Moses prayed unto the Lord. The fire, or unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? 
We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So the children of Israel were not content with the manna that God provided them. So they lusted after flesh to eat. They even referenced Egypt and the great benefit they had in the food supply there. Somehow forgetting the terrible situation they lived in while in Egypt. But nonetheless, they lusted after this flesh to eat. Psalm 106, verses 13 through 15. This caution to the Corinthians is first in line for very good reason. You see, with this lusting, Israel began a long and miserable journey. A journey of dissatisfaction and wickedness. They became discontent with God's providence. And this behavior resulted in continuous and severe punishment meted out by God. The chain reaction of lust is seen in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. We see that lust is brought on by our enticement and temptation. Lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. And when sin is completed or finished, it brings forth death. Now, oftentimes we think of physical death, but it would also include spiritual death. For the children of Israel... It was both, although we read directly about their physical deaths. This process of lust leading ultimately to death can be easily observed in the nation of Israel. It can can and does occur with spiritual Israel today, which is the church, us. Our second warning, Paul says that we must shun idolatry. Verse number 7 says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Shortly after leaving Egypt, Israel became idolatrous. Verse 7 is a clear reference to the golden calf of Exodus chapter 32. There we find the account of the people breaking off their gold, so that Aaron could make a molten calf, a molten image. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Aaron then built an altar for this calf, verses 5 and 6 of the same chapter. It says, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, and to drink, and rose up to play. They made an idol, this golden calf. Then they made sacrifices to this idol. Then they feasted on those sacrifices, and evidently also danced before this idol. They rose up to play. This behavior is evidenced, or this behavior evidences their corruption. Verse number 7 of our text. Now this sin had far-reaching consequences. Verse 25 of Exodus chapter 32 says, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. So not only did they sin against God, but nations around them saw this occurrence. Their enemies witnessed this event. They're, now they're, the enemies of Israel had occasion to speak against Israel, far worse to speak against God. New Testament Israel, the church, sometimes is found in possession of idols. Members of the church, Christians, can worship idols. Sometimes we chase the almighty dollar, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Covetousness is idolatry. Often it might take the form of 
how we spend our time. Many become slaves to their smartphone, that little device we keep in our pocket. Maybe we keep it in our hands no matter where we go. Some people are slaves to that device. Some people are slaves to the online mindless scrolling through various forms of social media. Some members are even slaves to events such as, you know, ball games, sporting events. Others even become slaves to supposed celebrities. We have to know what the Kardashians are doing. I saw a post similar to that, and then, what's a Kardashian? That's kind of where I'm at, but I know enough about them that I don't like them. They're sinful people. Yet even members of the church idolize them, and not just them, but many others. Jesus says that we cannot serve two masters, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It is either God or mammon. It is never both. God should be our top priority. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Our third warning. Paul says to abstain from fornication in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. We see in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3, that the nation of Israel committed fornication with the Moabites. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat, and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. <clears throat> it is widely accepted that such activities were used as worship to the idol Baal Peor, this fornication, this whoredom that Israel committed with the daughters of Moab. Thus we see that they defiled themselves with the daughters of Moab. And this brought about the deaths of 23,000 people in just one day. Corinth would have been quite familiar with this type of issue. There was a temple dedicated to the goddess Venus in this city. Venus was the goddess of prosperity, fertility, and many other things. The temple that was dedicated to her housed over a thousand prophetesses. Each and every one of them were prostitutes. Thus, Venus was worshipped by carrying out various acts of lewdness. Basically committing whoredom just like Israel of old. Indeed, the Corinthian brethren were once associated with such wickedness. Paul reminds them of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11. through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Enlisting the sins that will keep many out of heaven, Paul makes the claim that the Corinthian Christians were once a part of this group. This is a sin against one's body, that is, fornication. There are many consequences that will follow this sinful act. Broken families, various diseases, and a sin that we are quite familiar with is that of abortion. Many people who commit fornication, this act will oftentimes bring about a pregnancy. And people become murderers because of their foolishness. And they decide that they no longer want that child, so they murder that baby. Our fourth warning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. 
provoking Christ. Paul says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. We see that Israel tempted Christ in the wilderness. They tested God, and they even de denied the power of God. Numbers chapter 21, verses 5 through 6. It says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. <clears throat> you see, the children of Israel became practical atheists. They enjoyed certain benefits from God, yet they continued to complain against Him. And they would rather turn back to Egypt. Now we know that God cannot be tempted with evil. James chapter 1 verse 13. However, what the children of Israel did was to make trial of the Lord as some of them made trial. This is the ASV rendering of this verse. So they put God on trial as if he had not provided enough evidence that he indeed was Jehovah God. They spoke against him. And they preferred Egypt to the Lord Almighty. They basically threatened to leave God in favor of these lesser things. And because of this, they were punished. God sent fiery serpents to bite and to kill many of Israel. <clears throat> now Paul says that the Gentiles did this same thing by sacrificing to demons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verses 20 through 22 says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils or demons and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You see, when one attempts to engage in fellowship with demons, fallen members of the church, we provoke or tempt Christ. By doing so, we deny his all-sufficiency to guide us and to provide for us, both physically and spiritually. We claim that we have all the answers, and that we are superior to God. We might not say those things, but our actions, our thoughts, provide evidence for this line of thinking. And because of this, we become worthy of punishment, just as the children of Israel of old. Our fifth warning. This is murmuring against God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Paul writes, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Israel regularly murmured against God and Moses. Now this is not a mere airing of grievances, nor is it voicing one's concern. The ISBE has this to say about murmuring. It says it denotes the semi-articulated mutterings of disaffected persons. It is used in connection with the complaints of Israel or of the Israelites in the desert against Jehovah on the one hand and against Moses and Aaron on the other hand. In certain other renderings, it suggests the malicious whisper of slander. You see, these people were not merely complaining about their living status, their living situations. They ultimately were speaking against God. They were blaspheming him slandering God and Moses, and even Aaron. Israel quarreled with God and spoke against Moses. This occurred any time that they were met with adversity, anything that was not up to their supposed standards. When they were discouraged, 
They chose Egypt over Jehovah God. We see this after the twelve spies delivered their report of the promised land. And the people had the following reaction. There in Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God had died, or we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. You see this attitude later on in Israel's history when they request a king. Give us a king so that we may be like other nations. But Israel was wanting to replace their current leadership with their own, a captain of their own choosing. You see, they wanted to return to Egypt rather than taking the land of Canaan, the land of promise. For this, all those... 20 years and upward would perish, except for Caleb and Joshua. Numbers chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. We see in the New Testament that the Jews murmured against Jesus. John chapter 6, verses 41 through 43. They grumbled at his claims of being the bread of heaven. People today carry the same attitude against those in leadership. Think of how certain people despise the very idea of government. Even despise those who are in power in such governments. Those who hold public office are worthy of at least some respect just because of the office they hold. Now that doesn't exclude their immoral behavior but they are due some respect. But some people simply despise government. They don't have any issue speaking against those in authority. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 10. They speak evil against dignities and have no issue doing so. Sometimes members of the church are seen not submitting to elderships. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. When we do that, we murmur against God. And we murmur against the leaders that He is approved of by His Word. When men are qualified to be elders, they make up an eldership and we speak against them. We murmur against God and we sin thereby. We're called on to submit to them, just like we submit to Christ. Submitting is not simply, I agree with you. Submitting also includes, well, I disagree with you, but I'm going to obey anyway. Murmuring against God and his leaders ultimately brings apostasy, falling away. Our sixth warning. Paul points out that there is no excuse for falling. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. We'll read verse 11 at this time. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul concludes this list of specific examples and warnings and ends it with a general rule for our guidance. He points out that everything in the list that he just outlined serves as a type or an example. A type. The Jewish laws and ordinances of the law of Moses, those were a type. God's providence towards the nation of Israel, that was a type. The very sins committed by the children of Israel, those were a type. Even God's judgment upon them, 
Each of these things were types. Each of these points to how we can fall today. The Christian system is in effect and will be in effect until the end of the world when this world is destroyed. Backsliding and infidelity is seen throughout the history of Israel. And unfortunately, it can be seen in the church. Those who were, faith or were unfaithful were excluded from enjoying the land of Canaan, just as many today will be excluded from enjoying the promised land, that is, heaven, through their own disbelief, which is the besetting sin of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Each of these events, Paul says, were written for our admonition, for our learning, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. We're meant to learn from them and be better for it. But unfortunately, history tells us that we don't learn from our history. Which brings us to Paul's next warning. In light of the lessons from the past, we are expected to be on guard. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In light of the warnings that I've just given you, be mindful of this history because you too as Christians can fall. The judgments brought upon the nation of Israel serve as a caution to each and every one of us. They fell because they trusted in their own thinking and their own strength we too can succumb to this type of thinking, this type of behavior, this attitude. Most likely we can fall, or we're more likely to fall, when we put stock in our own strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. It is indeed possible for a Christian to fall from grace. But it happens because of our own choosing. Those who fear no fall are not guarded against such falling, such failure. Because of this, are more likely to lose their footing. The only way we have for true security is to obey and trust in God. James chapter 4 verses 6 through 8. Had the children of Israel done this, obeyed God even in those discouraging times, many more of them would be alive. And indeed they would not have spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Just goes to show you that if we follow God's way, it might not make sense to us in the beginning, but it is better for us. However, they chose their own way and ultimately led to 40 years of wandering and the death of many people. The warnings concluded were given a great caution and comfort. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. While we must take heed lest we fall, we should never be terrified. You see, we live in a world that is our proving ground. It's full of temptation. Every aspect of our life, every place, every relationship, every place of employment, even our enjoyment comes with its own set of temptations. Each of these abound with snares for the Christian. However, God promises to either that the trials will be provided to meet our strength or that we will, we will be provided with the strength to overcome such trials. We are assured that when we face such things, they are common to mankind might not sound like that, but that should be a comfort. Everything that we face, others have faced. All that we are tempted by, 
others have been tempted by before us. Even when we're able to overcome those temptations, others have also overcome those temptations. We see that Satan is the father of lies, yet God Almighty is faithful and true. Those around us are false. Those of the world are false. Yet God is our strength and our security. He will take care of his children. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. It is because of this that we may bear our temptations. It makes it easier to do so, but we may bear them because there's also a way of escape that's provided to us. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Now this way to deliver the godly out of temptation may come in the form of meeting that trial head on. Sometimes it requires following the example of Joseph, fleeing that situation. No matter what, God leads us like a shepherd. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, though we, may, we face many different trials and tribulations in this life, God is still there providing for us. God takes care of his children. Sometimes that means we need to be disciplined. That's where the rod comes in. But you see, that rod and that staff, they comfort that sheep. Why? Because it provides security. It supplies boundaries. Children thrive in security with boundaries. You know, we never grow out of that. Christians need security. Christians need what God supplies, and he does so. Thus, Christians are able to thrive if we choose to. Now, this morning we have discussed the similar or different privileges and blessings that the nation of Israel has enjoyed. We considered a small portion of their history. We see that the Red Sea saved Israel but it also destroyed the Egyptians. And this event serves as a type of baptism under the Christian system. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Baptism, this act of baptism, is what cleanses our alien sins and is the final act of obedience that allows one to be added to the church by our Lord, to the body of the saved, the church, Israel of the New Testament. This act, preceded by belief, repentance, and confession, qualifies one to be saved. The bread and water, which we read about ago, they were supplied in the wilderness to Israel as a type of life-giving bread, which we have access to today as well. John chapter 6. It's not physical manna. There in John 6... Jesus says that he is the bread of life, the eternal word. When we feast on that bread, we're spiritually refreshed. Thus, we become recipients of the great blessings that are found in Christ through his gospel. Unfortunately, many will follow after the example of Israel of old. 
They might enjoy the great blessings and privileges, the benefits of being God's chosen people. But through various trials, they choose to put away God. May it never be named so among us. May we never follow after that example of Israel. But their wickedness, ultimately rejecting God and His goodness, led to their punishment. We too can do the same thing, and this ultimately results in our loss of heaven. The church today stands to greatly benefit from the deeds of Israel. Those things were written for our learning. Hopefully we do learn from them. We can choose to obey God, just as the children of Israel did. They had the opportunity to choose. And by choosing to obey God, we have the ability to follow His pattern for salvation and become members of the New Testament Israel, that is, the church, the body of the saved. We've discussed what it takes to become a Christian. If you would like to become a Christian, follow that plan of salvation this morning. If you are already a child of God, yet you've allowed sin back into your life, put that sin away. Be restored to God. Either way, if you need to render obedience to the gospel, please do so as together we stand and sing at this time.